um, talk a bit about my ocean rowing adventures and um, how I have used those as a platform for environmental campaigning and also some of the environmental issues that I've encountered on my way across now three oceans. I think the last time I was at eBay, um, I was part way through doing the Pacific. I hadn't literally got off my boat especially to come back to speak at eBay, but um, I, I did stop off in a couple of places on my way across the Pacific. Um, so since then there have been another one and a bit oceans under my keel. Uh, so it's nice to be back here again to give you a bit of an update on that. Um, it was in 2000 and, oh, it's not working. 2008 that I set out to try and become the first woman to row solo across the Pacific. I'd already done the Atlantic Ocean back in 2005. And um, during that rather brutal voyage uh, through terribly rough conditions, um, and enduring breakages and injuries and loss of communications. I felt like I'd learned an awful lot about how not to row across an ocean. Um, also, that first ocean, it was so difficult, really just trying to get the whole thing together, to raise the money, to acquire the boat, to get the boat all fitted out, to do the training, that I hadn't really had time to get my environmental message across. So I felt like I still very much had unfinished business and the Pacific was going to be my big opportunity. If I'd hoped that the Pacific was going to live up to its name and give me a nice peaceful time, then I was very much mistaken. Um, shortly after I set out from San Francisco, ran into some heavy weather, big seas, and uh, the worst casualty of that was that water got into the locker where I keep the most important piece of equipment on my boat, the water maker. Uh, this is fully plumbed into the boat um, and it draws in seawater through a hole in the hull and through a process of reverse osmosis turns it into drinking water. And like most pieces of electrical equipment, it doesn't take too kindly to being submerged in seawater. And um, after a few weeks, um, the feed pump looked um, like this, and you don't have to be very technical to know that this is not what a piece of electrical equipment is supposed to look like. <laughs> so unsurprisingly, um, it gradually sputtered to a halt. Um, this was obviously a bit of a problem. Um, I did have quite a bit of spare water on my boat. It doubles up as water ballast to help stop the boat from capsizing. If you have that extra weight down low, it keeps it nice and bottom heavy. Um, but I knew that that wasn't going to be enough to last me all the way to Hawaii. And uh, this little message on my camelback drinking bottle suddenly became a little bit too close to the truth. <laughs> I drink or die. Um, but I somehow had this feeling that help would be at hand. My mum was very concerned. Um, she was aware of this problem with my water maker. And as you can imagine, the poor woman has many sleepless nights anyway while I'm out on the ocean and knowing that I was in, in danger of going rather thirsty certainly didn't help. And so she was asking did I want to try and get a container ship to divert to come and bring me some water. Um, I wasn't really keen on that idea because it's one thing to meet up with a container ship but then how do you actually manage to transfer water from a very big ship onto a very small ship without big ship squashing little ship. <laughs> um, and I was also rather worried that they would want to give me bottles of water. I couldn't really see how else they were going to manage to transfer water over to me. And my big message for this stage of my Pacific row was to raise awareness of the North Pacific garbage patch, this area of plastic pollution floating around uh, kind of northeast of Hawaii. So the last thing I wanted was a whole load of plastic water bottles on my boat. Um, luckily, um, help was at hand. Uh, people started posting comments on my blog saying, do you know that the junk raft is getting close to you? And at the same time, they were posting comments on the junk raft blog saying, do you realise you're catching up with Ros the rower? And um, over the course of the next few days, we. Um, made contact by satellite phone, and we managed to converge our courses. Um, I was the red line setting out from San Francisco, and they were the green line setting out from uh, 
Long Beach. And that little flag, a few hundred miles east of Hawaii, is where we met up for one of the, um, the world's more unusual dinner parties. Um, I'd just like to tell you a little bit more about the junk raft. Um, it was quite literally made out of junk. Uh, these two guys were from the Algalita Foundation, which was set up by Captain Charles Moore, who was really the first person to start documenting this North Pacific garbage patch. And um, this was like the cheap and cheerful down market version of the Plastiki, which was David de, Rothschild, David de Rothschild's project. Um, these guys um, took about two months to build their fine craft. Um, it cost them about $10,000. Uh, they got 15,000 empty water bottles and lashed them together with cargo netting to create these pontoons. Then the deck was made out of yachts from masts, just laid in a grid. You might recognize the cabin as the fuselage of a Cessna airplane. Uh, and then they stuck a sail on it and called it a boat. And they were also out there to raise awareness of the North Pacific garbage patch. Um, unfortunately, shortly after they set out from Long Beach, um, those 15,000 empty water bottles, um, all the lids started coming under, and the whole boat started to sink. So they had to pull in at Catalina Island to um, do all the lids up again before they could carry on. And the result of all this was that their voyage was taking them quite a lot longer than they'd expected. So they were running out of food. So it was actually to mutual benefit that we should meet up so they could give me water and I could give them food. And um, they were also promising me a fresh fish supper. Now I was really excited about this. Because uh, my snack bars and my bean sprouts that I grow on board and my freeze dried meals, those are all well and good. But the thought of having some nice fresh fish just um, was very, very appealing. And um, in fact, I ended up having to turn around and row back towards them because I was doing about two knots, they were doing about 2.1 knots. So it was like this very slow, like two snail mating, <laughs> trying, to, trying to coordinate our, uh, our rendezvous in the middle of the Pacific. And um, it became clear that if we just carried on at our respective two knots and 2.1 knots, then they were going to overtake me during the night and we would be quite literally ships passing in the night, which would have left me thirsty and them hungry. Um, so I actually turned around and rode back towards them and we had this, this little encounter. Um, <laughs> this video was directed by Dr. Marcus Erickson. He has a slightly idiosyncratic style, so just bear that in mind. I don't think Steven Spielberg's got anything to worry about. <laughs> It's a really cool rowboat that Ross Sanders is rowing across the Pacific Ocean to raise awareness about the plastic marine debris issue. We hauled in our surface trawl to show us what the marine debris issue looks like in the North Pacific Gyre. Meanwhile, Joe Hall did the mighty body we had promised her over the radio. We had a great meal together, trading food and water, took a few photographs as the sun set and parted ways. Thank you, Roz. We'll see you in Hawaii. And if you're interested in their work, um, Marcus and his wife Anna have now set up the Five Gyres Institute. Um, Five Gyres being, um, they had this theory that they've now proved that there are four more garbage patches like the North Pacific one and they've actually sailed across all of those now, again, gathering samples and gathering data. Um, they showed me this picture of a fish that they'd caught a couple of weeks before our dinner party, and when they'd opened up this particular one, they found all these fragments of plastic in its stomach, and um, they knew enough about the toxic effects of plastic that once, especially once it's in the digestive system of a creature, being mixed up with all those nice gastric juices, um, that it secretes these, um, these chemicals. And so this fish, they reckon, would not be good for eating. And it went back into the ocean. Um, but it, it just goes to show how that plastic is getting into our food chain. Um, the fish mistake it for food. And um, 
this is what happens. And then, of course, not all um, of our fish are inspected on an individual basis before they end up in the supermarkets. In their daily samples, they were typically finding six times as much plastic as plankton. So that's plankton on the right. That's the, the good stuff that's meant to be in the ocean, forms the basis of the whole ocean food chain. Um, and on the left is um, the corresponding amount of plastic that they found that day. So it's, um, it's quite serious, and, um, and it seems to be getting worse as well. There's an estimated 3.5 million tonnes of plastic floating around in the North Pacific garbage patch, and probably equivalent amounts in the, the other four garbage patches around the world. Um, a couple of weeks later, um, rode into Honolulu um, after 99 days at sea, wonderful sea dry land, and did a couple of press conferences with the, uh, the junk, the hunks from the junk, as they've become known. <laughs> Um, not everybody quite gets the, uh, the ocean rowing concept. I just want to show you a, a quite amusing little video of my encounter with the um, US Coast Guard Auxiliary on um, making landfall in Honolulu. sandy beaches, um, but the sad truth is that some of the beaches look more like this. Um, I think this one's Camilo Beach, which is um, on the big island. Um, and as you can see, just so much plastic washing up there. It catches most of the fallout from that North Pacific gyre. Um, and it was quite interesting doing the cleanups. Um, we actually had to do data analysis of what we found to try and figure out what the main components are, and they do reckon that about 80% of that plastic pollution floating around out there um, comes from land-based sources. Um, sure, some comes from fishing boats or cruise ships, but a lot of it blows out from landfill or if people drop litter in the streets and it gets into the storm drains and then into streams and rivers and, and it ends up in the ocean and from there it's got nowhere else to go. Um, some of it floats near to the top of the water column but an estimated 70% of it actually sinks down to the bottom of the ocean where it coats the ocean floor and interferes with the gaseous exchange, this dynamic exchange between the ocean floor and the water. So just on, on every level, literally, it's a huge problem. Uh, the following year, um, I rode from Hawaii to um, the Republic of Kiribati, um, which is the only nation in the world to straddle all four hemispheres north and south and east and west. So um, it crosses the equator and also the international date line. Um, <laughs> it's only about 20 years ago that they decided it was a bit ridiculous having half of the country in today and the other half of the country in tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you can't really imagine any other country on, on, in the world where they would have tolerated that situation for so long. And can you imagine if Manhattan straddled uh, two different days, how much a taxi driver would charge you to go all the way to tomorrow and back again. Um, as you can see from that first shot, it's a very low-lying island nation. Um, it has very few points of land more than six feet above sea level. So they are understandably very concerned about climate change and rising oceans. I had a very interesting conversation with the president while I was there. Um, 2009, the year I was there, uh, was also the year of the Copenhagen COP15 climate change conference. And um, I saw him and his delegation there on the last night of the conference. And um, as you probably remember, uh, the conference pretty dismally failed to come up with a fair and binding treaty on climate change. And the delegations from the small island states really felt very disenfranchised by the whole process. It seemed like the heavy hitters were shut away in one room talking money and power 
and the people who are going to be the real frontline victims of climate change, their voices just weren't really heard. So that was um, pretty sad to see these people who basically felt like their death warrants had just been signed. Um, I read in the, the news a few weeks ago that um, it looks like the Republic of Kiribati might be buying an island in Fiji so that um, when, if and when the time comes that they have to move, they will at least have somewhere to call home where hopefully they can move en masse and, um, and preserve their culture. Um, the science is still a little bit contentious around rising oceans. I had quite an interesting exchange with some Australian academics who've been researching this and they only had data from the last 16 years or so. Um, so it's really difficult to actually get a handle on the rate at which the ocean might be rising. But maybe the more imminent threat is that um, climate change is expected to create more extreme weather events. And so if there are more storms with waves coming in over the fringing reef, that's actually going to affect the water supply for these islands. They don't have any streams or springs, so their fresh water is formed by um, the kind of um, sponge filtering action of the coral base of the island. Um, the water gets forced through the coral, uh, which removes the salt from it, and then forms a freshwater lens between the sand and the coral underneath. And so the islanders at the moment just have to dig down a few feet through the sand and they can get to the fresh water. But when there's a big storm and all those waves coming in over the fringing reef, that water then becomes brackish and it takes quite some time for the salts to settle out from it. So it does seem sadly likely that uh, they will have to relocate from these islands where they've lived for thousands of years. Um, the following stage of the road was um, from Kiribati to Papua New Guinea. And um, it was quite a special leg for the, the amount of wildlife that I saw. Uh, there's a whale shark uh, with his little entourage of fish. They'd come right up to the boat and check me out. And sometimes <laughs> I spent 15, 20 minutes just um, doing laps of the boat while I ran around trying to film them. But as you can imagine, it's not, not very easy doing a quality camera job from um, the deck of a, a very tippy little rowboat. It was during that stage of the row that the, uh, there was the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, I remember <laughs> looking over the side of my boat where there's usually a little group of fish that just congregate there. I've become a sort of fish aggregating device on my way across the oceans. And I felt like I ought to be apologising to them on behalf of humankind that we are messing up their home in this way. And they don't have any choice. They obviously can't jump out of the water when we pollute it. And it just made me feel really quite ashamed, I suppose, that we are um, such a messy species and um, mucking up the planet for all the other species that have to share it. Um, I arrived in Papua New Guinea knowing that um, none of my team were going to be able to be there to meet me. Even my long-suffering mother had um, drawn the line at flying halfway around the world to come to Papua New Guinea. So I did wonder if I might just row up to the jetty and there'd be nobody there and I'd just kind of tie up the boat and go and sit at the yacht club bar and have a, a beer or two. Um, but I shouldn't have worried. Um, they'd obviously got wind of the fact that I was on my way. And as I was approaching land, this flotilla of canoes showed up, um, all bedecked in their traditional garlands. And about 5,000 people came out to greet me in. It was amazing. Um, even this very artistic um, banner. Um, there are 680 different languages in Papua New Guinea. Um, it's still very tribal. Um, quite a fascinating place, incredible natural resources there, great natural beauty. Um, but in, at the moment, it's in danger of really being exploited by other countries. The big news in Madang when I was there was that um, the Chinese were building a nickel mine nearby and they were going to be dumping the tailings into the. Um, oh, sorry, just pause that for a moment. 
Um, they were going to be dumping the tailings into the ocean, um, into the coral triangle, which is one of the last areas of really quite pristine coral reefs left in the world. Um, and they have, of course, done environmental impact reports um, that say they don't expect any significant upwelling, that the tailings will be dumped deeply enough that it's not going to affect the corals. But um, it seems that all too often we really only find out what the environmental impacts are going to be <laughs> when the impacts happen, when it's too late. So I just really hope that that's right. Um, some local people were saying that they needed the development there, they needed this big mine because it was going to help the country to pay for education and for healthcare. But I'm a bit skeptical about that myself. The Chinese mining company had been given a 20 year um, tax break and they weren't going to be employing any local people, they were bringing in a completely Chinese workforce. Um, Chinese people had even built the, the village that was going to accommodate the miners. Um, they were going to be importing their own foods. I just couldn't see any knock-on effects for the local economy at all. And if I was that Chinese company, I guess I would use it up in the next 20 years and then get out of there before I have to start paying any taxes. Um, while I was there, there was a government march protesting against... Uh, sorry, there was a march protesting about government corruption. So I suspect that really the only people who were going to benefit from this were the, uh, the politicians. Um, while I was there, I did another beach clean-up. I spoke at a school, um, which is always fun to do. In fact, this morning I was speaking at a girls' school over in Oakland, and it's just really nice to have the opportunity to connect with some younger people and show them you don't have to be six foot five and bearded to go and have a big adventure. Um, <laughs> and after the talk, we went and did a beach clean-up. Um, like many countries in the world, um, there is a big problem in um, Papua New Guinea with um, plastic bags getting everywhere. So we went along this, um, the waterfront, picked up lots and lots of rubbish, um, and sadly, the, after the next Friday night, their kind of party night, I walked along there and <laughs> there was a whole new batch of rubbish. But I guess that's how it goes with cleanups. You just keep keep on going. Um, but there is a great sense of satisfaction in actually looking back along a beach or a waterfront or a riverside and um, seeing it look all nice and clean, even if it is only a very temporary state of affairs. Um, if that's a little bit less plastic um, going into the oceans and um, killing wildlife and getting into the food chain. So that was the Pacific. Um, I'd just become the first woman to row solo across the Pacific. Um, after a total of 250 days at sea, um, covering about 8,000 miles and um, destroying several water makers along the way. Um, then last year, I rode the Indian Ocean. This was going to be my longest single ocean voyage uh, because there isn't really anywhere to stop off in the middle. So it's going to be 4,000 miles and it took me ultimately five and a half months to get from Western Australia to Mauritius five and a half months, all alone in my little rowboat. Same rowboat as before, just a new paint job. I um, decided to go purple this time around. Um, and luckily managed to make a safe landfall in Mauritius, um, thereby becoming the first woman to row across three oceans. Probably the first woman to want to row across three oceans, actually. <laughs> but it doesn't say that in the Guinness Book of Records. Um, the mission always really has been environmental. Um, there have been those days out on the ocean when I just thought, this is so hard, why am I doing this? And I think if it really was just about getting to the other side of an ocean, well, there are easier, quicker and cheaper ways to get there. Um, but it really has always been about something bigger than me. Um, even when I am justifiably very scared in the middle of the ocean, like last year, a few capsizers, which are not fun when they're going on and really questioning what I'm doing out there. I guess there's something that scares me even more, and that is what will happen if, um, if we don't all do everything that we can to get the awareness out there about these environmental challenges that we're facing. And um, people sometimes say to me, well, what can I do? Um, I think 
we've all just got to tackle it every way that we can. Um, to some people it seems like there are so many different heads to this monster of um, environmental crisis. Where to even begin with that? But it seems like the root cause is really what's going on in seven billion heads. The attitude that we have towards this planet. Is it there just to serve our needs? Can we just use it up and burn it up? Um, and how can we really expect to do that and continue to do that without expecting repercussions? We tend to think that this planet is so big that human beings couldn't possibly make a difference. But having rode around most of this planet now, I can tell you it's not quite as big as we think it is. Um, even a small woman in a rowboat going at two miles an hour can cover most of it in 520 days or so. Um, and so we can't just keep taking all the good stuff out of the earth, turning it into crap, and then throwing it into landfill and into the oceans. Um, it would now take one and a half planets to sustain us with the lifestyles that we have in 2012. And as the developing world raises their aspirations and their standard of living, that's only going to become an increasing problem. Somehow we have to find a way to live more sustainably. And we're not talking about saving the planet here. We're really talking about saving humankind. The planet's going to be fine given a few squillion years. Um, we'll be a dim and distant memory by then. We really are talking about how we as human beings can have a happy and healthy future on a thriving planet. Or if we're going to end up in a kind of wall-y world where we've had to leave the robots to clean up all our mess while we float around um, in, a, in a spaceship. The way that I had my environmental awakening was through reading about the Native American uh, belief that we have to take good care of the earth if we want it to take good care of us. And that really, for me, was a pivotal moment. Um, I'd had this very materialistic London yuppie lifestyle as a management consultant, doing this job I didn't like to buy stuff I didn't need. And when I sort of got that concept of the human complete dependence on the earth, I just really felt like I had to take up my oars for the cause and do whatever I could to try and spread some ripples of awareness. And just wanting to finish on a, a positive note, I think some people feel like anything that they do as an individual is just a drop in the ocean, that they're too small to really make a difference. And I like to use this image of the five million oar strokes that it's taken me to row across three oceans. One oar stroke only gets me a few feet, but you take five million of those tiny actions and you add them all together and they really, really do add up to something very significant. So there's something that we can all do, like starting from right now. I know I'm preaching to the converted here, that you all already get it. But please do what you can to spread the word to your friends, to your families, your colleagues. Um, just gently try and remind them that um, certain kinds of behaviour are just not good for the long-term benefit of, of humanity. And hopefully if we all keep doing our part, we will reach a tipping point. I don't think I personally am going to manage to save the world, but I just hope that I'm adding a few little straws onto one side of the balance, and eventually the scales will tip and we'll have a widespread outbreak of common sense and realise what we're actually doing. And hopefully once we actually get it, then we will get our acts together and do what needs to be done to ensure our future. Um, I'll just round off by... Um, saying that uh, we do have a few books here up at the front. Um, I think we're doing okay for time. I'd be happy to take some questions. Um, and then afterwards, um, if anyone would like to buy a book, I'd be very happy to sign them for you. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yes. <clears throat> so um, do you have a background in rowing? Like why rowing? How do you um, I do have a background in rowing, um, admittedly um, in a nice fast racing shell with eight other people on board. Um, I rowed at Oxford University and I suppose when I had that midlife crisis 
when I decided that management consultancy wasn't what I wanted to do with the rest of my life and that I wanted to do something more um, purpose-driven. Um, adventure just seemed to be the way that I wanted to go. There were a few other things going on in my life at the same time. Uh, the end of a marriage and I suppose a need to prove my self-sufficiency. Um, and I did know about the existence of ocean rowing. Um, when I first heard about it, um, there was a news story in the British papers back in 2001 about a married couple who had set out to row across the Atlantic. And he was your kind of typical adventurer, six foot five, 220 pounds, really looked the part. And she was about my size. But within the first week or so, it became very evident that he just couldn't cope with it psychologically. He was just lying in the cabin in the fetal position, quaking with fear. So he had to get lifted off the boat and she carried on on her own. And I suppose that when I was looking for my, my cause, um, or I suppose my platform, that story came back and um, was just enough to give me the confidence that rowing across oceans was maybe something that, that I could do. Yes? Can you share some details about your boat as to, like, like how do you eat, how do you sleep? I mean, how's your typical day? The boat's 23 foot long, 6 feet wide, um, weighs about a tonne. Um, it's made out of carbon fibre hull. Um, a typical day would start off with me uh, crawling out of my sleeping bag, turning on the GPS, looking to see where I've got to overnight. Um, then during the day, I typically do uh, a total of 12 hours of rowing, three hours on, one hour off, um, so that I can get most of my rowing done during daylight hours and then give my body eight hours off overnight, um, during which time I blog and get as much sleep as I can. Um, how successful I am in that depends on how rough the night is. Um, uh, what were the other questions? What about, oh, eating. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned I eat snack bars and nuts and bean sprouts and um, freeze-dried meals. So I have just a little camping stove that I use to boil up water uh, and add that to um, hot food. Um, oh, also on the boat I have solar panels. That's how I charge everything um, and how I power the, um, the water maker. Um, so those have worked pretty well for me over the years. Probably the one bit of kit on my boat that hasn't broken. <laughs> so when you're sleeping in the night, does your boat just drift away from the ocean current yeah. or how do you keep it on um, I plan my route so I'm generally going with the prevailing winds and the prevailing currents. But prevailing just means sort of 80% of the time. So there are some mornings where it's a bit of a disappointment when I turn on the GPS to find that, um, <laughs> that I've got off course. But um, it's unlikely to be a surprise. Um, it's, it's rare that I would um, have a surprise one way or the other, good or bad. Uh, I think my, um, my best ever night, I made 22 miles in the right direction in my sleep. So that was a very good start to the day. But then there are some tricky currents as well. Crossing the equator was really quite difficult, going through the doldrums. And you've also got these weird little currents because if you can picture the North Pacific, it goes like that. And um, that's where all the plastic accumulates is in the middle. And the South Pacific, the currents are going in the opposite direction. But in between those two big circulating systems, you've got an equatorial countercurrent that's flowing east. And where that current meets these currents, you end up with all these kind of funny little swirly eddies that could really play merry hell with my navigation. <laughs> yes? What was the time from the thought to action? And two, why did you want to do a solo? Did you have any problem with the others? Um, so it was the first question, what's the call to action? We took for you to translate from the thought to action. You, know, you had this thought and then from the time the thought came to action. Yes, I, I got sort of clobbered over the head by this idea uh, to go and row across oceans um, in the summer of 2004 and it took me 14 months from a standing start um, to actually launch onto, um, onto my first ocean, the Atlantic. <laughs> Is that, did that answer your question? Um, and then why, why do I go solo? Um, well, I, <laughs> I did actually float the idea past a couple of friends. Um, you know, I was fairly choosy who I would go rowing with, so um, I wouldn't have asked just anybody. But when I sort of mentioned to these friends that I was thinking about rowing across an ocean, 
they <laughs> looked at me like I completely lost my mind. And so I, I sort of took that as a no. Um, and in fact, there are many um, benefits to rowing solo. It does mean that you can determine your own, um, your own rowing schedule. Um, having said that, I do have a, a new adventure coming up this year where I'm actually going to be rowing across an ocean with a crewmate for the first time ever. Um, last year, I announced that I'd retired from ocean rowing. I really felt like I'd taken rowing alone across oceans as far as I could. Uh, not to mention that my boat was starting to really show signs of wear and tear. Uh, but then just about a month ago, I got an email from someone that I know through ocean rowing. Um, he was rowing the Atlantic at the same time as I rowed the Atlantic back in 2005. And I knew that he'd been planning to row across the North Atlantic this time around. So the, the east to, sorry, the west to east route, it said the east to west, um, with another guy. And he was getting in touch to say the other guy had had to drop out of the project, or would I consider stepping in? So uh, that's the situation now. I emerged from retirement um, to row with a guy that I don't actually know very well yet. <laughs> Although by the end of July, I guess I will. Um, and the plan is that we'll be rowing from St John's in Newfoundland um, over to Britain, hopefully arriving in time for the start of the, the Olympics. And um, if you want to follow that, that's my, my website address there. I will be blogging as often as I can find the, uh, the energy. I usually blog every day while I'm on the ocean. It's just going to be a bit different this time around because traditionally when you have two or more rowers on the boat, you do shifts of two hours on, two hours off alternating so one sleeps while the other rows. So instead of having my nice eight hours off overnight to allow my body to recover, I'm never going to get more than about one and a half hours of sleep at any one time. So when it comes to that crunch choice between am I going to blog or am I going to sleep, I'm not quite sure which way it's going to go. <laughs> but hopefully even if they're shorter blogs this time around, um, I'll still be posting. Yes. Did you run into any pirates? <laughs> Did I run into pirates? It was actually a very serious concern last year because around about January last year, just when I was planning the Indian Ocean, um, two, uh, four Americans were shot dead by pirates um, in the Indian Ocean, actually up in the Arabian Sea. So I had originally been planning to row from Western Australia to Mumbai in India. But in order to do that, um, to line up with the winds and currents, I was going to have to row quite close to Somalia, like Pirate Central, uh, which obviously didn't look like a very good idea. Um, so I had to change my route to go to Mauritius instead. But yeah, it was very much on my mind. Um, I took advice from marine security consultants, and their advice was, don't go. <laughs> I was like, that's not the answer I was looking for. <laughs> Can we try again, please? Um, so we, we ended up compromising that I would change my route and also that I wouldn't advertise my, my position online. Because um, in previous years, I've always had an online map showing my exact latitude and longitude. And last year, it just didn't make sense to take that risk. So um, yes, it was a bit of a shame, really, because it's usually the most visited page on my website. Um, but we, this year, luckily, we will we'll have the map back, and it's going to be a really cool one. The, the Weather Underground are putting it together for us. So it's going to have all kinds of cool meteorological um, overlaid information on it. Uh, we won't be able to see it from the boat, but you'll be able to see it from dry land. Yes. What was your worst nightmare, and where uh, you almost started up giving up, and how did it come out? My worst nightmare? Well... The <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the Atlantic um, was the benchmark by which all other rows will be measured. It was just so hard, largely because it was my first ocean, so I was on a massively steep learning curve. Um, everything was breaking. Um, I had tendonitis in my shoulders, so I was in a loss of pain for most of the crossing and that can really um, affect your... It's hard to maintain a sunny outlook when you're actually just really hurting. Um, and probably the, the toughest aspect of it was that um, my stereo broke really early on, so I had no entertainment at all, apart from my own thoughts. And um, it was like Vipassana on steroids. It was um, um, 103 days of myself. Um, that's, that's quite intense, really, and um, yes, we went through a lot, me, myself and I, on that trip, <laughs> <laughs> but 
but um, emerged more or less sane um, on the other side. But I suppose the, um, the, the closest I've ever actually come to dying was um, the year before last on the, um, on the Pacific Ocean when I accidentally dropped my boat hook overboard. And um, I didn't really need the boat hook back. Um, I had another one on board, but because I do so much campaigning around marine pollution, I didn't want to leave objects floating around out there. So I jumped into the water to go and retrieve it, but as I'm swimming back to get it, the boat's drifting away in that direction. And um, swam over to it, picked it up, turned around, and go, oh crap. <laughs> That's not looking too good. And so I, I tried swimming back to the boat with the, the boat hook, but it's not easy trying to swim with a four foot pole in your hand. So fairly soon I had to abandon the boat hook. Um, but by then I was already quite tired and it was really hard work trying to catch up with the boat. And um, it might sound a bit corny, but um, what gave me the little kick of extra speed that I needed was remembering a conversation I'd had with my mother and she literally had a nightmare about this. Um, she told me about this dream she'd had in which they found my boat floating at sea. And um, in her dream she knew that um, I must have been lost. And as I'm there in the water, in danger of not catching up with my boat, <laughs> I went, I can't die out here, my mum will kill me. <laughs> and, um, and just that thought was enough to give me that bit of extra speed that I needed and uh, I just remember collapsing onto the deck of my boat with my heart absolutely pounding just thinking well that was a bloody stupid thing to do wasn't it <laughs> so um, yes I'm not going to be no matter what drops off my boat from now on I'm not going after it <laughs> yes what keeps you emotionally uh, motivated what, what drives you uh, and what keeps you optimistic when you really don't know if there is light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, um, I suppose there are three things. Um, one is, I learned the hard way that it's good to keep a really clear vision in my mind of how fantastic it's going to be to make landfall and get to the other side and have my first hot shower, my first night in a proper bed, my first decent meal. Um, but then just to concentrate on what do I have to do today to get a bit closer to that and not think about the however many thousands of miles lie between today and the landfall, because that way lies madness. <laughs> um, second thing is that sense of, I suppose, the environmental mission. Um, just this purpose that's much bigger than my little day-to-day -day sufferings in the boat. And then the third thing is um, the number of people who over the years have supported my adventures in so many different ways, through donating, time, money, energy, support um, of all shapes and forms. Um, over the years, thousands of people have helped to finance my adventures. I have had some corporate sponsorship. Um, I put my, my own speaking fees and book advance into the, the rowing, but a lot of it has been crowdfunded by people sponsoring a mile, chipping in their hard-earned cash um, to actually help support what I do. And so on the days when I'm thinking, oh, you know, if, if it was down to me, I would quit. I think, well, I can't because I owe it to these people. They've invested in me. They've shown, they've shown faith in me. And um, I, I really have to um, reward that faith. So um, that really, really helps to motivate me. Yes? I guess my question is a little bit more personal. I noticed you were wearing a bikini top. What do you do to protect yourself from sun damage? <laughs> um, actually, I don't even usually wear as much as a bikini top. It's just because I was being photographed. Um, <laughs> although on the North Atlantic, I'm going to be wearing a lot more than a bikini top. We're going to be rowing through icebergs up there. Um, I use um, organic sun cream made by a British company called Green People, who actually have just um, started importing to the States now. Um, and I've actually found their stuff really good. I've tried using non-organic SPF 50 and, and I burned um, compared with using the organic Factor 22 um, that seems to have worked pretty well. How do you get it on a hard to reach spot? <laughs> on the oh, I'm very bendy. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, so do you know any efforts going on to prevent new junk entering the ocean as well as any efforts to clean up what's already out there right now? Yeah, um, my general feeling is that we do 
need to focus on the prevention side of things. Um, so things like plastic bag bans are helping. Um, quite a few countries have deposit schemes, or in fact some of the, the states here um, have deposit schemes as well, which have a really dramatic effect on recycling. I was watching a very good film the other day called Tapped, um, have any of you seen that? It's about um, why bottled water is such a massive rip-off. Um, and um, with just so many bad side effects as well. But in that, they had this really interesting statistic that um, in the States overall, the recycling rate on plastic bottles is 30%. Um, but in States where you've got a five cent deposit, that goes up to 50%. Um, and in Michigan, where there's a 10 cent deposit, um, recycling goes up to 97%. Yeah. So it makes a really dramatic difference. So it um, would be great if more countries are introducing bottle bills so that people are actually financially motivated to, uh, to do their recycling. Um, on the cleanup side, um, there are some projects out there. Project Kaise is one that's raised quite a lot of money. But at the moment, even their most ambitious target is um, to retrieve 50 tonnes of plastic a year from the North Pacific Garbage Patch. And I don't know the exact numbers, but I would guess that there are many, many, many more tons than that going into the North Pacific Garbage Patch every year. So that's really not even making a dent in the problem. Um, of course, the issue is how do you pull out the plastic, these tiny little fragments, without pulling out all the good stuff as well. Um, and also, so much of the plastic is on the ocean floor. And as you know from the recent news around James Cameron, um, that the, um, did I get that right? Is that his name? Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> there's actually been a lot of really funny headlines in the UK about that because our um, present Prime Minister is also called Cameron, David Cameron. So all these things about Cameron plumbs new depths, it makes <laughs> some great headlines. <laughs> anyway, sorry, the point of that was before I went off on a tangent um, that it's going to be just really practically impossible to retrieve that plastic that's on the ocean floor. So I think we human beings have difficulty in maybe accepting that some things can't be fixed through human ingenuity. I mean, I would love it if, if we did have a, a feasible scheme to clean up the North Pacific, but in the meantime, my efforts are very much focused on getting information out there about the problem, about the impacts on human health, um, how many um, man-made chemicals are being found in our bodies, um, and just asking people to remember their reusable grocery bags and their, their mugs and their, their water bottles and just doing everything that they can, uh, particularly around single-use plastic items. I mean, to me, it just makes no sense to make disposable items out of an indestructible substance. <laughs> there are alternatives. So um, that's, that's where my focus really lies. Yes? Now, the, uh, in the video before you started your talk, it shows you rolling, and it looks like you're struggling, your form doesn't look good, and you're favoring your left leg. Is there some story behind up that? Um, you criticize my rowing style. <laughs> <laughs> I have practiced a lot, you know. <laughs> um, the reason that um, my legs look funny is because um, I've just generally found it more comfortable to row with one foot in and one foot out of the rowing shoes. Um, also, it helps even up the suntan, because otherwise, <laughs> um, I found when I arrived in Antigua and I drove with both um, feet in the rowing shoes the whole way across, I looked like I'd stepped into a can of white paint. I was like, beautiful all over suntan, but completely white feet. Um, and I just find it a bit more comfortable to row that way. Um, so, it might look like a bit of a weird, gimpy rowing style, but um, it's, it's very different. I found it very different from um, river rowing. Like in river rowing, typically 80% of the power of the stroke comes from your legs. You, um, you get your blades in the water and you, you lock on that contact and then you drive with the legs. Because obviously these are the biggest, strongest muscles in the body. Um, but on the ocean, so much more of the time, you're actually just trying to get both oars in the water at the same time. And if you were going to drive without a proper connection on both sides, you'd be falling off the seat. So I, I, I was surprised uh, when I set out across the... Um, the Atlantic, just how much more upper body was required. In fact, I find that my legs tend to really atrophy when I'm on the ocean because I'm not, not walking anywhere. And you, you can imagine five and a half months of not walking. 
mussels just disappear, really. Um, in fact, it's quite a common ocean rowing affliction, which is you, you make landfall and it's like your, your gluteus maximus just doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> I remember after I finished the Atlantic, putting on a, a pair of pants that um, had been quite a snug fit before I set out, but after losing 30 pounds um, and completely losing my bottom, um, <laughs> these pants just fell straight down to my ankles again because <laughs> there was nothing to hold them up. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Um, plastic. Yeah. So, I mean, other than recycling, what are, I mean, this might be a naive question, but like, what are other ways we can decompose or Great question, make them actually. smaller? <laughs> yeah, um, well, in many ways, recycling is quite flawed. Um, in, the, in the waste hierarchy, it goes reduce, reuse, recycle. So, if we can actually reduce the amount of plastic that we're using in the first place, then that's, that's a huge help. Um, so, for example, by drinking tap water or filtered tap water rather than um, buying bottled water. That would have a huge impact. Um, and then um, reuse, you know, just um, if you can use something multiple times, then um, it's reducing the environmental impact of that. Um, and then really if all else fails, then recycle it. Um, there are new technologies emerging, um, new kinds of plastics, um, some of which are a step in the right direction, others of which are not as um, environmentally friendly as the manufacturers would like us to think. Uh, things like bioplastics are not necessarily biodegradable. They can actually take plant-based plastic or plant-based um, substances and <laughs> through the miracles of science turn it into a non-biodegradable um, plastic. Great. <laughs> but bioplastic sounds all lovely, doesn't it? And even some biodegradable plastics uh, will only biodegrade in a, a particular kind of composter. Um, they need air, they need warmth. So if they end up in the ocean where they have neither of those things, then they're not going to biodegrade. Um, so my general approach is, as well as spreading awareness at the grassroots level, um, I'm also, I think we need the top-down approach as well, uh, because at the moment, there is so much confusion around this, and it's not easy for people to do the right thing. San Francisco is streets ahead of many parts of the world. Um, I think you're not allowed to have styrofoam um, takeout containers now, and um, there are curbside recycling facilities, and yeah, it's, it's so much better, but generally, most people are time-starved, they're just trying to you know, keep their jobs, um, keep the wife happy, keep the kids happy, pay the rent. They don't really have time to become well informed about what plastics are environmentally friendly and which aren't. So it would be great to actually get um, more globally um, change at policy level so that it's easier for people to do the right thing. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, yes. Refuse, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. <laughs> refuse is the best. I, I get a tremendous feeling of smugness when I say, I don't need a bag, thank you. I've got my own. <laughs> and I'd like to say it just a tiny bit louder than necessary. Um, again, it's um, adding those straws onto one side of the scale. I would love there to come a day when it's just so kind of socially unacceptable to um, be seen with plastic bags. It would be a real social embarrassment. And we, we can change the culture. I mean, like... Um, even 50 years ago, um, in certain sectors, I don't know, um, words relating to somebody's ethnicity were sort of okay, it was, it was common practice, <coughs> and now it's just not, the culture has shifted. So if we can um, make that culture shift in reference to race, then why not in reference to plastic, to let people know that some behaviours are just not okay? Yes? Um, plastic is a culprit, but what are the other culprits that you think are contributing equally to the environment destruction? Um, you're right, plastic is probably not the biggest um, environmental challenge facing us right now, but it is quite useful in that it's, it's visible and tangible, whereas things like carbon dioxide are a little bit of a tougher sell, I suppose. Um, Oh, there are so many other things to worry about, um, especially in relation to the oceans. Um, I was at, um, there was a special TED conference in honour of Dr Sylvia Earle and her wish for the oceans. 
and so they held this conference in the Galapagos Islands and um, for about four days we were bombarded with really bad news about the oceans. Um, ocean acidification, um, coral reef destruction, um, coastal habitats um, being destroyed by careless coastal development, um, overfishing, um, the list goes on, but I suppose it's all symptomatic of that lack of joined up thinking. Like if everybody in the world behaved as I'm behaving now, then what would the consequences of that be? So um, there's so much, I think the challenge with environmental messaging, and I think about this a lot, the scary science doesn't really seem to have won the number of converts that we would have hoped. The scary science has been around for decades now. Um, if people want to know, it only takes a quick Google to uncover all these um, big scary stories. But a lot of people find that really quite demotivating, unappealing. Um, it's not really winning converts. So what do we do about that? And I think this is you know, it's a really interesting topic for, for conversation. And I suppose what I'm trying to do is to present a more positive role model of how you can have a more fulfilling um, but less materialistic life. How you can be happy or happier when you're looking for happiness in the right places through having a sense of purpose and passion in your life, through having good friendships and relationships instead of looking for happiness in shopping malls. Um, I've tried that route. Yeah, I used to be a, a really materialistic person and ultimately it just didn't make me happy and now I've got so much less stuff. I don't have a home, haven't had a home since, I don't know, seven years now, um, which is a fantastic way of um, just acquiring less junk in your life. And I feel that because I don't have to spend time um, earning the money to buy stuff, actually buying it, maintaining it, moving stuff around, that used to be such a, an energy sink, just all that maintenance that stuff takes. And now that I don't have to do that, it, it leaves me free to focus on the things that actually make me feel good about my life. So, works for me. I'm not saying it works for everybody, but um, it's, I think, helpful to just present that as an option. Um, because we do seem to have fallen into such a very consumer and growth-oriented society that it is time to look at alternative options. And I'll just add a little personal note there. Um, just want to let you in on my plans for later on this year, after I finish rowing the North Atlantic, assuming that hopefully that all goes according to plan. Um, I'm going back to school. Um, I'm going to be going to Yale for their World Fellows program. And so 16 of us World Fellows are going to sit around for a semester putting the world to rights. Um, and I'm really excited about that. It's um, sort of a crash course in leadership covering politics and economics and sustainability. And um, I've just been... Um, we the 16 have just been introduced to each other so of course I've been googling like crazy to find out who all the others are and I think it's going to be a pretty amazing group so I'm very excited about that so that begins in mid-August so watch this space. Sorry in the interest of time I think if we can make one last question and then move on. Yes can... I'm also starting to hyperventilate a bit. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can you describe your interactions with uh corporate sponsors or sponsors from the very beginning of your ideas of going to the first Atlantic crossing to how it goes down, how it actually goes pre-event or pre-crossing during it and afterwards? Um, interaction with, um, with corporations, is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. Sponsors, yeah. Sponsors, um, to be honest, there hasn't been very much interaction. Um, I think I had a bit of a credibility problem when I was doing the Atlantic. Unsurprisingly, there I was in my late 30s, no previous history of adventuring, um, not even much previous history of athletic endeavour. Um, so I did get some small amount of corporate sponsorship then, but really a tiny amount. I ended up putting in pretty much my life savings to buy my boat. Um, I did have a wonderful corporate sponsor for the Pacific Row, um, Brocade, who are based here in San Jose. Um, and um, they had the title sponsorship for the Pacific Row. So my boat went through an incarnation when she was called the Brocade. Um, but since then, it's pretty much been crowdfunded. I haven't even really approached companies. The only reason I got the Brocade sponsorship was because I was exhibiting my boat at the Tech Museum here, and um, the CEO of Brocade was on the board of the museum, and so we got talking, and um, he decided that this was going to be something that they wanted to support. 
Um, in the future, I would, um, I would love to do more work with companies. I would love to get invited to be an environmental consultant uh, for some of these companies to figure out how they can um, really be genuinely sustainability minded. Uh, there are some companies out there that are paying lip service at the moment and I don't, in a way that's a step in the right direction. If they have to fake it till they make it, well at least hopefully they're on that path to making it. But it would be really nice to see genuine commitment to that. Um, I've actually been a bit disappointed um, in what I know about this year's 2012 Olympics in London that wanted to, was claiming to be the most sustainable Olympics ever. And I was co-patron of a campaign asking them to go plastic bag free, which seemed pretty much like a no-brainer if they're claiming to be sustainable. And they just weren't willing to do that. They did ban single-use plastic bags, but that just means that they're producing thicker plastic bags that take longer to break down. So, um, and also apparently you can't, um, you're not supposed to take in water bottles like this. So if I wanted to go and fill up at a water fountain, I, in theory I wouldn't be able to do that. As it turns out, I don't have tickets for anything. So, uh, but if I managed to get a ticket to something, I would almost quite like them to try and confiscate this just so I could kick up a real stink. <laughs> um, but I guess that's the problem when you have really big corporate sponsors like McDonald's and Coca-Cola. Um, they want you to buy their products once you get inside the Olympic venues. And we're still in a world where money talks. I really saw that in Copenhagen. Um, that was quite an interesting experience for me. I had quite a few illusions shattered about um, just whose interests are esteemed leaders are taken care of. Um, it didn't, certainly didn't make me feel like they were taking care of my personal long-term interests. So that's why I'm a real believer in people power. Uh, we need to let um, our politicians know that it's a vote winner to do the right thing and we need to let the companies know that um, they will win our customer if they do the right thing. I really believe that every one of us as consumers, every time we buy something, or choose how to throw something away, or decide how to get from A to B, we're casting a vote for the kind of future that we want. And we really have to cast those votes wisely. And on that note, <laughs> thank you very much indeed for coming along.